I heard the promise to declare over each and every one of you who has felt like you have lost your voice. Matthew 10, 26 says, don't be intimidated. Eventually everything is going to be out in the open and everyone will know how things really are. So don't hesitate to go public now. Don't be bluffed into silence by the threats of bullies. There is nothing they can do to your soul, your core being. Save your fear for God who holds your entire life, body and soul in his hands. We cannot cave to the fear of man. We cannot be bluffed into silence. We cannot be bullied by our culture. When we have the big answer, we need to stop arguing about the small questions. You don't need to do that for me. I'll go to sleep, but thank you so much. I, I, I had a massage earlier today. I'll just be like, I'm gone. The other thing is I, I want everybody that says they've had a rough let's just say 18 months. If you've had a rough 18 months, I want you to stand your feet right now. If it's, you're like, nope, it's been, it's been amazing. Okay, if you've had a rough 18 months, stand to your feet. Do I got everybody standing? Okay, I'm just gonna tell you this right now. You're about to experience breakthrough after breakthrough because what you went through did not break you. So understand that this struggle was for strengthening and these obstacles were to prepare you for this season in Jesus' name. Amen. You can sit down. One other thing. I, I was so excited that Joe prayed for women to get pregnant. You do know that faith without works is dead. But if there's... I know that I know we all like pounced on the beautiful woman in the pink that was like, that's me. But I also felt like I heard in the room that there's some other women that feel like they could never get pregnant. Do you know that God heals all diseases? Do you know he doesn't just heal the nice diseases? Do you know he heals the diseases that we actually think people deserve to have? Do you know that? Psalm 103 verse 1 through 5 says, Oh, my soul. Actually, I'm going to read it from the ESV. It says, bless the Lord, oh, my soul. Bless the Lord, all oh my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Bless the Lord, oh, my soul, and forget not all his benefits. Who forgives all your iniquity. Another one says sin. Is there any sin that God's like, mm, sorry, can't, can't forgive that one? Is there any sin? I mean, outside of blaspheming the Holy Spirit, but let's not talk about that. Is there any sin that God cannot forgive? Are you sure? Are you sure? Okay. And then what it says, forgives all your sins and it doesn't say or, like you get to pick. He either forgives your sins or he heals your diseases. You have to choose one or the other. It says, and heals all your diseases. I remember I had written a book called uh, Kiss the Girls and Made Them Cry, and I kind of got in trouble for it, and I, I wanted to be on this radio show, and they were like, no, we're not going to have you on the radio show, Joe, because I wasn't endorsing masturbation. They said, we're not having you on the show, and I was like, what? I'm sitting in my backyard like, God, it's only me. It's only me and you, and, and he says to me, what can I do in your meetings? I said, you can do whatever you want. He said, I want to start healing my daughters of STDs. And I was like, what would that look like? We need all the herpes to come over here. I want chlamydia up here. Anybody that, I mean, I'm like, God, you know, that doesn't, that's not how it works. You can't, you can't, don't do that. And he said, yeah, we're not doing that. He said, I, I'm going to send my word and I'm going to heal them. So last weekend, John and I had the privilege of hosting a marriage retreat. And there was this beautiful young girl that I guess, I don't even remember, I had prayed over her and prophesied over her when she was 18. Then I prayed over her when she was 20, and God completely healed her of an STD and an eating disorder all at once because the shame of the one tends to feed the bondage of the other one. And now, now she is like a superwoman has three kids, is like top tier in her business. And she said, I've been waiting all these years to come back and tell you 
what God has done for me. I don't know if any of you got the Godmother's book last night, but I actually have a testimony in this book of a model that got herpes the very first time she ever had sex. And she prayed with me a prayer I'd written out and God healed her. And then she became known as the person to go to if you needed prayer. Because it's not just about the disease. It's about the shame and the iniquity that attaches itself to it. So I'm not going to call anybody out, but I am going to say that God wants to send his word right now into your body and heal you. That God has forgiven you of all your sin. Not just the Christian girl sins of maybe gossiping occasionally. I'm talking about the crazy hoe girl sins like I had. He wants to forgive you of all those sins and, and heal all your diseases. But he doesn't stop there. He's not like, well, I'll forgive you and I'll heal you and redeemed your life from the pit who crowns you with steadfast love and mercy, who satisfies you with good so that your youth is renewed. So I want everybody just to close their eyes. And in the name of Jesus, I send the word of healing into your body. I wash away the shame. I cleanse the guilt. I open up what the enemy has eaten away. I thank you for legacy. Father, the enemy is after the seed. Father, I thank you for legacy. I thank you for mercy. I thank you for regeneration. In Jesus' name, I speak cleansing to your body and break the power of shame in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I was just pausing and I thought, I, I just need to do that because there's some women in this room that can't get pregnant because of something that they did a long time ago. And I've had so many testimonies of women who have told me that God just supernaturally touched their body. And so if you're like, I, don't, I, I didn't know, I was getting all nervous, I put the prayer in the book. I believe that we can pray the word of God and that things can happen in our body at home alone. So anyway, last night I was preaching out of Godmothers, why you need one, how to be one, about closing the gaps. So that is out there. I'm going to be also be speaking on it a little bit tomorrow. But today, because I figured out you guys are, you guys are like high paced people. You guys are like fast track. Fast track, I'm gonna do two messages. I'm gonna like merge, I'm gonna, mer no, I'm gonna talk really fast. I've had, how many, who's had more than six shots of espresso? Okay, one person, you've had more than six. How many have you had? Eight, I love that. How about you? Six, okay, I had six shots and a nitro. But anyway, so I, and then I had a spark. Anyway, I love caffeine. Caffeine is my friend, and uh, the most I've ever had is 12 shots. Anyway, that's not what I'm talking about, but I wanted to set up the story about how much I love caffeine, how much I love espresso. I sleep all night so I can get up in the morning and drink espresso. I go to bed and I'm like, go to sleep. You can get up and you can drink it tomorrow morning. It will be there for you. And my husband got me an espresso machine, and I just hover over it like I'm the Holy Spirit. I turn it on, I'm like, come on, come on, it's going to happen. And I just, I get up early so I can move slow. I do not like to be startled. I don't like, I like to move slow. If my husband start talking to me too soon, I'm like, shh, shh. No, your loudness is bothering me. Don't, don't be too happy. Don't be too loud. And I live in Colorado. So I was bundled up in like a fluffy flannel pajamas and a robe and my Ugg slippers. And I, I like decided I got my coffee. And let me just explain what I do in the winter. I do shots of espresso. And then I top it with whipped cream. And then I open up a drawer below it where I have 100% dark chocolate unsweetened. And I pick up a knife, which I probably shouldn't handle before I've had caffeine. And I shave the dark chocolate on top of the whipped cream. Then I do a little cayenne pepper, cinnamon, and raw sugar. And I'm like, hallelujah. The first sip is the best. I picked it up and I sat down, just getting ready to take that first sip when I made a fatal error. 
I had been going through a devotional, but in that moment, I thought, I'm gonna pick up my phone. I'm just gonna go into Twitter. It'd be like having coffee with friends. And all of a sudden, I'm going through a Twitter feed, and everybody is thanking somebody for putting them on a list. And of course, my first reaction is, am I on the list? It was the list of the top 100 female ministers in the United States of America. I open up the list. When your last name starts with B, you find out really quick whether you're on it again. I did give them the benefit of doubt. Maybe they put it under Lisa. I go down there. I don't see it under Lisa. I keep scanning the list. And then I have three consecutive hot flashes. I go into my husband's office. My husband is praying. He's a Christian. He's reading his Bible. I go into his office, a flurry of flannel pajamas. And I said, oh my gosh, I can't believe it. I didn't make the list. I'm never going to make the list. John, I'm 54. I'm 60 now. So I've grown up. I'm 54. I'm never going to make the list. And my husband just calmly looks at me over his reading glasses and he's like, what list are you talking about? I said, I need your phone. He's like, why do you need my phone? I said, they said at the end of the list that perhaps they have forgotten people. I said, John, they put the people that translate my books from English to Spanish on the list. They have certainly forgotten me. And he's like, nope, nope, you are not. You put my phone down. You need to go pray. And I, then he quoted a scripture to me and I stomped my foot and I said, you know what? I know I'm wrong, but that doesn't make this feel right. So what did I do? I pulled off my slippers, put on my Ugg boots, went outside on the deck, and I called Christine Kane. I know now I should have called Pastor Kara. I should have called Pastor Joe, but I called Christine Kane. She was on the elliptical machine. I began to tell her, I was like, Christine, you're not even gonna believe this. They made a list of the top 100 female ministers, and I am not on the list. And Christine says, well, am I on the list? I said, yes, and you're not even American. You're Australian. And she was like, why do you care? I said, you know, you can't say that to me because you already asked me if you were on the list. So you can't, you can't say anything. But you know, Christine was just like on the elliptical. I said, you know what? You know what? It was just a confession. It was just a confession. So I hung up the phone and then I started to think, you know what? I have more Twitter followers than that person. Maybe I'll just make my own list. Maybe I will make my own list. But then I thought, nope, that's menopause me. You need to stop that right now. <laughs> then I thought, that's right, lists are evil. Other people are waking up this morning and feeling left off. But I heard the Holy Spirit say, and yet, if you had been on it, you would have retweeted it. So at that point, I went into my bedroom, shut the door, hit my knees, said, God, I've been acting, no offense, like an eighth grade girl. If there's any here, I'm sorry. I've been at maybe seventh grade. I don't know. I've been acting ridiculous. It was like a 20 minute meltdown. Come on. You guys have all had them, but you didn't tell them from a stage. And so I'm like, God, I'm so sorry. I texted Christine. I'm like, hey, listen, I'm great. I went into my husband. I said, listen, I put an estrogen patch on my hip. We're going to be okay. Everybody's going to make it through the day alive. And I went through my day when something unusual happened. Apparently, I had been invited to speak at a banquet and I couldn't come. So they made a plastic doll out of me. Go ahead and put the plastic doll out there. And they thought that maybe John would enjoy having the plastic doll. So this is a plastic doll. There's my husband in the background. You can kind of see him. And they said, perhaps John would like to put this in his office. And I'm like, no, this is getting thrown away. And when I picked up the plastic doll, I heard the Holy Spirit say, well, are you happy now? You're a plastic doll. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you, when you and I look for our value or our affirmation from other people, that's what we end up. Flat, fake, and plastic. <laughs> Learn from me. You don't want to have a 20 minute meltdown and then have to write a book about it. Okay, Tim Keller said, we want someone 
of ultimate glory loving us. Not just love in general. What we need is this ultimate assurance of who we are. Ultimate assurance of our worth. We need someone like that loving us like that. We need someone we think the world of thinking the world of us. We need the praise of the praiseworthy. Do I have any moms in here that just have one child? Wave at me. All right, hallelujah, one child moms. Okay, I'm just going to say this. It's not nice, but I am going to say it because it is true. One child is an accessory. You take them out, you dress them up, and they behave well. It's all a trick to get you to have more children. Anyway, do I have any moms that have more than one child? Wave at me. Okay, you're going to understand my story. Okay, so we went... And it's not an insult on one child. It's one child, I, like, hallelujah. Hallelujah, you were smart. Anyway, I, I, uh, <laughs> we went to South Korea. And uh, I came home so jet-lagged. I was working on a manuscript. Your pastor mentioned it last night, Girls with Swords. And I fell asleep at my laptop. I woke up eight pages later of the letter T. I had just depressed one. And I was like, oh my gosh. So I thought, you know what? I'm just going to lay down. I'm just going to lay down. So I grabbed my dog and I was laying down. And as I'm falling asleep, I heard, I do not love my children equally. I sat up and I was like, that's blasphemy. God, you have to love us all the same or it wouldn't be fair. He said, same implies that one of you are replaceable. Equal implies my love can be measured. He said, I don't love my children equally. I love them uniquely. And then I began to think about when I was pregnant with my first son and I was so excited to give birth to him. And then I was like, I want six because I wasn't smart. And then, and then when I got pregnant with my second son, I remember thinking, I'm so excited. They did the sonogram. Back then, the sonograms looked like aliens. They were like, that's her head. I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure? I don't, I remember putting the video in for Addison and I said, here's your younger brother. And he was like, no, no, it's a skeletal, scary thing. So, so I, I remember I started near the end of my pregnancy. And you know, you can be weird when you're pregnant. Near my end of my pregnancy, kind of being distressed. I thought, I love Addison with all of my heart. And now I'm going to have to share the love I have with Addison, with Stranger Baby in the sonogram, who looks like an alien. And I, I know how much I love Addison, but I just don't know about Stranger Baby. But how many of you know, how many of you know, when you have that second child, it isn't that the love you have for the first child gets cut in half. Something brand new opens up in your heart and the things that you love about that second child are unique to that child and the things that you love with that first child is unique to that child unique is better than equal and if you go look at the definition of unique it means prototype it means one and only but my favorite definition of unique is without rival there is no one who can take your place in the heart of God. There is no one who can take your place in what God wants to do in this earth. We serve a God who is without rival. So it would stand to reason that we are his creations without rival. If he has no rival and he has no equal, then you have no rival and you have no equal. So why are we allowing rivalries to rob us? Do you know it all began with a rivalry? Do you know the problem didn't begin in the garden? The, part, the problem began with Lucifer. When Lucifer said, I will ascend. I will be like the Most High. See, you can get familiar with the presence of God. And when you get familiar with ministers or the presence of God, you can begin to think, I could do that. Then you start thinking, well, I could do that better. And you lose your ability to receive because you now see that person as a rival instead of as a sister that you're both pursuing God. And so we need to understand that the enemy has always used rivalries to split. We got the rivalries between male and female. 
We got the rivalries between young and old. We got the rivalries between black and white. We got the rivalries going on every place in this earth. But if we understood and honored the uniqueness of every race and every tribe and every tongue, that we would not have rivalries. We would actually be celebrating the unique contribution of each and every one of them. So I feel like now I need to share a scripture. Uh, the scripture that my husband quoted me that morning, because he is a Christian, is 2 Corinthians 10, 12. It says, not that we dare to classify or compare ourselves with some of those who are commending themselves, but when they measure themselves by one another and compare themselves with one another, they are without understanding. Did you hear that? That means you're stupid. Okay, so <laughs> let's talk about the three things that are going on there. The first one is classify. What happens when we classify people? We grade them. We put them in a box where we can disqualify or we can be connected to them. It's called pigeonholing. And have you ever seen what pigeons do in the holes that they live in? There's poop and there's feather fallout. You do not want to be pigeonholed. What it is is a very simplistic, small-minded view that misses the intricacies of challenge. How many of you know that everybody we know is going through something, something more than we can see on Instagram? Come on, we need to start having some compassion for other people. What happens when we classify is we label them. We label them. You know, there's a label on the chair that we're sitting on. And last night while I was sitting in the chair, the label was getting in my hair. And I, I was like, whoa, it's getting, so I had to bring it low. But I have to tell you, there's been other conferences where I moved the label incorrectly and I had it on my backside. And people didn't want to tell me that I had a label on my backside. And that's usually what happens is that if you have a label, it will follow you. It will follow you. I remember, I remember the label I used to wear as a minister. It was okay for me to preach to women. Oh, but no, no, no preaching to men because women were the last to be created and the first to sin, easily deceived. So I had these labels in the back of my mind and anybody that loves God the way I love God would never want to do something to dishonor their father. And so I had a label on me. And what does a label do? It limits you. It limits you not just to what they might see in this moment, but it attaches you to who you have been. But see, God doesn't label us. He calls us by name. And God doesn't call us by the name that even our parents know. God calls us by a name that we are becoming. I don't know if you read the book of Revelations. It's kind of scary. But it says in the book of Revelations that you and I are each going to be given a white stone with our real name on it. And we are alive right now to grow into the likeness of that real name. But our culture will only echo our used to be name, but we have a God who is declaring a larger name, a God breathed name. And you know what he did so we could grow into that name? He said, Jesus, give them your name. Do you know that? Do you know Jesus didn't like, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lend it to you and I might take it back. He said that Jesus has a brand new name. It's written on his thighs. It's kind of scary. Up, so tattooed again, revelations. It's got some interesting things in it. He's got a brand new name. Written on his thighs. What does thigh mean? Thigh always means legacy. So he gave us his name. He gave us the authority of his name. He gave us the name that is above every other name. So why are we calling one another names? Why are we not calling upon the name that is higher than every other name? When we've been given the name that is above everything, we should not be wasting our time with labels. The next C is comparison. What happens when we compare? Well, no one says it better than Theodore Roosevelt. He said, comparison is the thief of joy. I'm just going to paint a picture of comparison in my own life. You go on a date night with your husband. You go to a movie. And at the beginning of the night, you're happy. But somewhere during the movie, 
you notice the way the pretend husband is kissing the pretend wife. And you're like, when did he kiss me like that last? He never kisses me like that anymore. He used to kiss me like that. So you go into the movie theater happy with your husband and you leave mad. And he's like, what's wrong? I'm like, you know what's wrong. No, he doesn't. He has no idea you have been comparing him to Thor. He has no idea. No idea. No idea. So I can get mad about my husband not kissing me like Thor kissed whoever it was. Or if I don't like what's going on, I can grab that man and kiss him the way I wish that he was kissing me. So I can have a good night or I can have a bad night. But comparison will always take me down a pathway I don't want to go. Comparison. When we first started out in the ministry, we were so poor. The biggest thing we were believing for was a minivan. I mean, our kids were praying for a minivan every single trip. We were all in a Honda Civic. We had two children in the back with a suitcase between them so they didn't hit each other. I was pregnant with Alec. I'd have to stop every like three hours and get out of the car and run around it to keep the blood flow into my legs. It was crazy. So we are praying and believing for a minivan. And you know what would happen? I'd go to a church and there'd be a mom with one child. And she'd be like, I don't know why, but I just got given a minivan. And something inside of me would panic. I'd be like, that's my minivan. That's my minivan. Let me trade you my Honda Civic. I need your minivan. But instead I would say, praise the Lord. But I had the mindset, mindset that her minivan had been taken out of my bank account. Like, I don't know, but I kind of thought that if God was blessing her, it must have been deducted from me. No, if God is blessing somebody else, you need to be happy for them. You need to say, if God can do that for her, he's going to watch how you celebrate, and then he can do it for you. But not if you compare yourself. Well, I deserve it more. I produce more children. No, we don't get to do it with that. So we've got classify, compare, and then we've got the third one which has become an art form in our day. Self-commend. People taking pictures of themselves. No filter. No, y'all, you guys, I use filters. I'm gonna tell you that right now. I use filters. I can't even, I've gotten so lazy about putting on makeup. I'm like, why do I wear makeup? I can wear a filter. And, but people, and then people like, I just gave $100,000 million to the poor, hashtag love Jesus. Guess what? You just got your reward because Jesus said that if you tell everybody, you just got it. We need to send some things to heaven. We need to stop bragging about everything we're doing here and, and have some secret deposits in heaven. I don't want to get up there and him say, yeah, Lisa, I really had some rewards for you, but you put them all on Instagram. <laughs> Self-commend. Self-commend. Measuring ourselves by ourselves, with one another. What does that mean? Am I supposed to measure myself by other people? No, I'm supposed to measure myself by Jesus. It says looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher. That's who we look at. John 5, says, how do you expect to get anywhere with God when you spend all your time jockeying for position with each other, ranking your rivals and ignoring God? Rivalry will rob us of your strength. I believe there is a generation right now that God wants to do a new thing in. I've had the privilege. I, it's hilarious. I still do youth conferences. I still do youth conferences. I love that. I'm like, they'll have a token, old person, grandmother. It's me. I get to do the youth conferences. I did Bethel. I do Jesus Culture. I, I traveled with Bethel, Bethel in a bus. I did a 14-city music tour as a grandma. Hallelujah. Anyway, so I love young people. I love millennials. I birthed four of them. I think they're some of the most amazing, entertaining, and intelligent people on the face of the earth. And I'll have them come up to me, and they'll be like, I know God has his hand on my life for something significant. And I'll say, yeah, I agree. 
And they'll say, but I have no idea what it is. <laughs> well, you will never discover what you are called to do looking at what everybody else has done. You will never discover what you're called to do in the presence of people, even if it's just an Instagram scroll. You discover who you are in the presence of God. And when you discover who you are in the presence of God, once you know who you are, then he tells you what you are called to do. Because too many people are trying to find out where they're going and they don't know who they are. And if you don't know who you are, you will not even know how to behave once you get there. You've got to have an identity that is grounded in Jesus Christ. You've got to know who you are. And he will tell you who you are becoming. I can't even tell you how many times I've been in the presence of God and he will whisper something over me and to me that seems completely absurd. I, so absurd, I'll start laughing. I'll start laughing. I remember before I wrote my very first book, I had four babies. I was sleep deprived. My husband was traveling and the publisher I worked on John's books and they asked me to come and meet with them. And John said, I think they're going to want you to write a book. And I was like, that is a joke. It's one thing to be an editor of your husband. Every woman is anointed to edit their husband. It is quite another thing to write a book. And I remember I'm putting makeup on for like the first time in 15 weeks. And I see myself in the mirror and I'm like, this is a joke. This is a joke. What is this crazy breast milk leaking, sleep deprived woman. Why am I going to a professional meeting? And I heard the Holy Spirit say, you are not who you see. I said, yes, I am. I am all those things. He's like, no, no, you're somebody only I see in secret. And he said, what you see on the outside actually contradicts what I see on the inside of you. And he said, if this day, if you will move beyond your limits and your comfort, I will change your life. And I left and I wrote my very first book while I was breastfeeding my fourth son, out of control and loving it. And I figured nobody would ever read the book, but it was a seed of obedience. Seed of obedience. I didn't call on my friends and say, do you think I should write a book? Because you know what? They would have said no. And I said, yeah, me neither. I don't think I should write a book. When God drops something in your heart, you have to do it. You just have to do it. So you can't you can't compare it with other people. You can't do it. And you can't brag. Guys, there's one thing, one thing that God resists. God resists the proud. Resists the proud. He's like, I want to draw you near, but I'm going to have to push you away. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Listen to this, Galatians 5.19, it says, it is obvious what kind of life develops out of trying to get your own way all the time. Repetitive, loveless, cheap sex, a stinking accumulation of mental and emotional garbage, frenzied and joyless grabs for happiness, trinket gods, magic show religion, paranoid loneliness, cutthroat competition, all-consuming yet never satisfied wants, a brutal temper, an impotence to love or be loved, divided homes and divided lives, small-minded and lopsided pursuits, the vicious habit of depersonalizing everyone into a rival. Oh, we call it cancel culture. Uncontrolled and uncontrollable addictions. Ugly parodies of community. I could go on. This isn't the first time I've warned you, you know. If you use your freedom this way, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. That's God talking to the Galatian church. And I've heard people say, well, that's okay. I'm, I'm fine with the suburbs. But see, I kind of feel like if he says, I warn you, you probably want a different real estate location. This divides. And it, this describes our culture right now. Every single bit of it. And Galatians isn't a letter to the world. It's a letter to the church of Galatia. So we need to say, okay, what's going, what's going on? What's going on? This is all the bad news. What's going on? Romans 12, 5 says, So since we find ourselves fashioned into all these excellently formed and marvelously functioning parts in Christ's body, let's just go ahead and be what we are made to be without 
enviously or pridefully comparing ourselves with each other or trying to be something we aren't. See, pride says either I am better than you, and then that sets up our fall, and insecurity says I'm, I'm, I'm so yucky that it isolates us and nobody gets your gift. So we can't think more of ourselves than we should. So we need to stop seeing one another as blocking the promises of God in our lives. Now, this is the message of without rival. Finding your identity in an age of confusion and comparison. But it's not enough to just have identity if you don't have truth. Isaiah 51, I believe it's 51, but it might just be 50 verse 1. It says, hang on, I'm going to jump over there real quick. It says, 51 verse 1, look to the rock from which you were hewn and the quarry from which you were dug. So I wrote a book called Adamant. It's a horrible title. I realize that now. Uh, the subtitle was better. But I'm a little random, and I had studied about two particular stones. There is something you probably have heard of called the Philosopher's Stone. It was a stone that if you found this stone, you would have access to wisdom. Then there was another stone called the adamant. And the Greek poets and philosophers made up both of these stones. I'm going to talk to you about the adamant stone. In the Greek, it's actually called Adamus. And Adamus means invincible because they believed that the Adamus stone would be woven so tightly that any inferior stone or metal that came in contact with it would be crushed. They also believed it was magnetic, where it would draw but never be drawn. They believed you could put it in fire and grab it out and it would be cool to the touch. It would not be subject to its environment. They also believed it could gather light and redirect it. And so they figured that any nation that could find this metal or stone would be invincible. So it's interesting to me that they were thinking about this stone and it predated Jesus Christ. Now, what happened was in the seven, when they discovered diamonds, they actually thought a diamond was an adamant but then in the 1700s, they put a diamond in a vacuum, magnified light on it, and it vaporized. So adamant no longer meant a stone. It meant unyielding. It meant stubborn. It meant immovable. But here's what I want to talk about. See, we don't look for mythical, magical stones anymore because we have been stripped of our awe. We find ourselves clothed in shame and confusion. The highly educated often lack the opportunity to even get a job. And if they do have a job, they would have a glaring lack of purpose. We have bound ourselves to monetary systems of credit designed to entrap us in debt. Our political system that was created to unite us, now divides us. Our networks are vast, but our connections are shallow. We have an abundance of sex and a famine of intimacy. We have chosen to become what we do, and yet we remain unfulfilled. We use technology to throw stones at people that we will never have to face. When the truth becomes fluid, we lose contact with answers bigger than ourselves. And so I'm going to propose something. I'm gonna propose that I believe that Jesus is the adamant. You think, well, how do you get that? Do you remember this, just kind of this throw off comment by Paul where he said, and that rock that followed them in the wilderness which was Christ. It also talks in the book of Isaiah that there is a 
cornerstone that was not cut with hands. It also talks about in the vision that Daniel interpreted, or the dream Daniel interpreted for Nebuchadnezzar, that he saw a stone not made with hands, and that stone hits the image of everything that is man-made. And what happens once it destroys it all? It says the stone becomes a mountain, and the mountain fills the earth. Well, we believe that is Zion, and we believe that mountain that fills the earth is the church of Jesus Christ. And so I believe that we have a choice to either fall on the rock and be broken or the rock falls on us and we are crushed. And our culture right now needs you and I to stand up for truth and fall upon the rock. Because what has happened in our culture is that the church for too long preached the truth without love. And the truth without love is harsh so our culture has responded by preaching love without truth. But love without truth is a lie. And you and I are alive in this time where we have to merge both truth and love. And we merge truth and love with how we live our lives. Not tell everybody how to live their lives. It's how I live my life. That people are saying she's loving, but she is holding fast to truth. Do you know that we all have to have an answer larger than ourselves? We are created where we have to have a connection. You know, I was reading, I don't know if you know this, our earth is made up of a core, an inner core, and then an outer core, which is called the mantle. And they're saying right now that the earth's core is unstable. And the axis is pivoting. Well, I'm just kind of at this place right now where I would say I feel like the church's core is unstable and the axis is pivoting. I believe that we can lean into Christ, that Christ is that rock that is higher than I, and he doesn't just dig a little hole out for you on the side, but you are fully immersed, you are protected in him, that in Christ we have a frame of adamant. What does that mean? We have an invincible frame and a soul of fire frame of adamant, soul of fire. What does that mean? It means that nothing should ever frighten us because hardship lifts us higher. If you are in Christ, you have nothing to be afraid of. We have to be those people who understand what is going on right now. You know, all through this conference, Kara and Joe and I'm so honored to minister alongside Joe. She's one of my favorite people. She is somebody that is a truth teller. She is somebody I would pick up and ask hard questions to. But all through this conference, you've been told God's doing something. God's gathering his daughters. He's raising them up, up as warriors, but not warriors attacking other people, but warriors carrying truth and love. And because I opened with a coffee story, I'm going to close with a coffee story. So I went to a particular city in Texas, and when I arrived at the hotel, I said, where is the closest Starbucks? And they said, oh, no, no, you don't want to go to Starbucks. You want to go to the palace. And as soon as they said it, I was like, yes, I, I do. I want to go to the palace. My heart, and they're like, you can't go now. It's closed. It closes at 3. And so I was like, okay, what time does it open? They're like, 6 a.m., so what did I do? Next morning, 6 a.m., I get up, brush my teeth, put my sunglasses on, and I head across the street to the palace. I open up the door, and it's got this cool Texas hipster vibe. I begin to shake. I'm so excited. I'm like, these are my people. When it came my turn to order, this is pre-COVID, when it came my turn to order, I held hands with the barista. I was like, tell me what you have. Tell me what you have. She said, we have a microphone cappuccino. I'm like, what kind of foam have I been drinking? Have I been drinking large foam? She said, I don't know. I said, well, I, I'm going to have to try a microphone cappuccino. And, and she said, but, well, you need to hear some of the other things we have. I said, okay. She said, we have a fig and honey latte. I said, yes, I want that too. And then she said, but my favorite is the lavender latte. I said, I want all three of those 
three shots each. And I turned to walk to the magical end where the coffee comes out when a man stops me. And he's like, are you from here? And I was like, okay, wait, is there like, like a rule that if I'm not from here, I can't be loose on the streets with nine shots of espresso in me? Like, why is he, why is he asking me a question? I said, no, I'm from Colorado. And he's like, well, what are you doing here? I'm like, buddy, look at me. I am inside with sunglasses on. You are breaking all the rules right now. You shouldn't be talking to me. But, but he kind of looked like Santa Claus, so I thought I'm gonna be nice to him. And I said, well, I'm here for a woman's meeting. And I thought right then he'd be like, okay, I'm not a woman, I'm gonna back away. But he didn't, he was like, where's it at? So I turned to the barista because I tend to just get in cars and forget where I'm at. And I said, can, can you, I knew the name of the church, but I was like, where's it at? And so she told him where it was at. And he's like, well, why are we not covering it? And I'm like, what do you mean? What do you mean covering? He said, well, I'm the editor in chief of the local newspaper. If a thousand women are gathered, why are we not covering it? Now I begin to panic because I have the reputation of the body of Jesus Christ in my hands and with an editor and I have no caffeine in my body. He said, could you please sit down? So I sit down with him, I start drinking the microphone as fast as I could, which is not easy. Microphone is not easy to drink fast. So I'm start drinking the microphone and, and he starts asking me all these questions about what was going on and I told him what was going on. I told him what amazing place it was, how they were outreaching to the community. And then all of a sudden he said, well, did you read the Pope's article? I'm like, which, which one? Which one? He said, the one about the excavation of the catacombs. I said, I, I didn't read that one. He said, can I have your phone? I'm like, wow. We have broken every social norm right now. I will unlock my phone and hand it to this gentleman. So he types in the thing. He's like, you need to read this. And I thought, okay, when I get back to my hotel room, I'll read it on the toilet. That's what I thought, I didn't say it. And he said, yeah, they're excavating the catacombs under uh, the Vatican and they found mosaics of women preaching. I'm gonna put it up for you. This is Priscilla. And they know that she's preaching because her hands are open and benediction. And he said to me, now you're telling me that you're preaching. So I just have a feeling that you're one of those women. And when he said that to me, something inside of me exploded. He said, now I can't come tonight, but I will be there tomorrow morning in your Sunday morning service. And you know what? He showed up and he put me on the front cover of the living section. And I preached out of Romans chapter 1, 19 through 2, 6. And he says, Christian minister tells the truth. <laughs> and when I walked back to my room that day, I thought, I feel like I just had a moment. And God said, you did. You begin to tell my daughters that they're one of those women and that it is time for them to come out of the catacombs. It is time for them to stop picking up the broken pieces and understanding that I am making a mosaic out of their life. See, what peace, what pain, what tear have you shed that God has not kept it do you know how precious they are? So I want everybody to stand to your feet. Listen to this. This is Isaiah 40, verse 25 through 26. God is talking. He says, to whom then will you compare me? That I should be like him, says the Holy One. Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who brings them out, their host, brings out their host by number, calling them by name, by the greatness of of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Lift up your hands and say, I'm one of those women. I'm coming out of the catacomb. I'm leaving behind the grave cloths. I'm leaving behind a realm of shadow and shame. 
I'm not just coming out. I'm opening my arms and I'm welcoming other women as they come out. I'm calling them out of a shadow. I'm calling them out into the fullness of everything that God has for them in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. There is a Mexican proverb. It says, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. Everything the enemy has done to try to bury you, just understand, you're a seed. You're a seed and the hardship in one season comes up as fruit in the next season. The hardship in one season comes up in a tree of righteousness in the next season. I don't know what has compressed your life, but God has concentrated his faithfulness to you. And I believe that this concentrated presence of God and faithfulness is going to explode and expand. But we have to be willing to leave behind what's not working. We need to leave behind the bondage that we just keep going back to, the past that we keep rehearsing. We need to lift our eyes and lift our voice and declare our way forward. God is doing a new thing, and it looks nothing like your old thing. God is doing something that you cannot do. He is making roadways in a wilderness. He is making pathways in seas. He is doing exceedingly, abundantly, above all that you can ask, hope, or pray. But you know what? He needs you to ask. He needs you to ask, so I don't know what has you trapped. I don't know what has you lurking in the shadows. I was talking with Bethany about a book that I read that I absolutely love, and it talks about when the American soldiers liberated Auschwitz, that so many of them had been prisoner war for so long that they walked out of the camp and then turned and walked back in. You can get used to living as a prisoner of war. You can get used to just encircling your pain and your bondage. But I don't believe you're called to be a prisoner of war. I believe you're called to be a warrior. And if you are called to be a warrior, you got to shake yourself and you got to get up and you've got to go forward in Jesus' name. So who's coming out? Say, I'm coming out. I'm coming out. And then you know what else you're going to do? You're going to call other people out. You're going to say to your friends, why sit you here until you die? Let's go and just see if us walking forward is going to sound to the enemy like a mighty army instead of some broken women. I just want to know what might happen if some crazy Walla Walla women begin to declare the word of the Lord and Spokane women, and Pullman women, and Seattle women. I'm so tired of the Northwest, which is so beautiful, being known for the new age. How about it being known for God's reign in Jesus' name?